Wildlife as you've never seen it before now on BBC Two. Live updates on the creatures that are living all around us. Let's go wild with Bill Oddy. Wow. I don't know about flaming... It's even better. Absolutely glistening evening down here on the farm. And before we go any further, I and my enormous production team and the animals and the birds would like to thank Tim Henman for winning quickly enough to allow us to welcome you all to the second day of the biggest ever celebration of British wildlife. Although I have to say, yesterday we thought we're not going to be able to celebrate very much because um, we had a bit of a fright. Or rather, our baby blue tits did, because this happened. You can see a great spotted woodpecker eyeing them. And believe you me, he's not thinking of giving them a kiss. They were in serious danger. So have they survived? Well, all I can say is if they haven't, we won't be just wild, we'll be flipping furious. We can promise you some absolutely terrific animal action tonight. We really do have some good stuff. Um, some of it four-legged and furry, for example, our otters, which you may remember left floundering in the surf and wondering quite seriously whether they were going to survive the storm. We have some roe deer in a most extraordinary setting and of course our badgers. Will they or will they not emerge live? And if they don't, we'll show you some good stuff. Anyway, the jackdaws, um, a wren, perfectly bang on time, popping its head out, that's a new nest. And this is our blackbird's nest with three youngsters and there is mother blackbird. Not sure where father is at the moment, neglecting them a little bit, I think. So, so we really have got some fantastic stuff and of course we have Kate Humble relishing in the sunshine. Oh no, yes. it's lovely. Relishing That's in the sunshine, English. just relishing the sunshine, sorry, relishing. sorry about the English. Yeah. <laughs> well you are no doubt desperate to know about the blue tits as am I but we oh. will be continuing to uh, look at all our birds as well as looking at the status of our wildlife throughout the UK. I'll also be giving you a lot more ideas on what you can do to help nature in your area and join the thousands who've already pledged to make space for nature. But first, let's cross over live to that magical island in Scotland, the even more magical Simon King. <laughs> Welcome to the Bass Rock on this bracing but very beautiful evening. I'm just over a mile away from the nearest point of mainland Scotland, 25 miles away from Edinburgh and yet around me over 80,000 gannets. But out of that huge number of birds, we've been concentrating on a couple of key characters, the Lighthouse family and the Braveheart family, both of whom are in attendance at the moment, I'm pleased to say, and we'll be looking at them later on in the programme. We'll also be looking at some of the other birds on nearby islands, including that most charming of birds, the puffin. We've had a preview this afternoon and they're really something worth waiting for, I can promise you. Um, the blue tits, yes, 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 yes. Uh, well, you can tell it's live because I was going to flash a picture up earlier and there was nothing there. My camera seems to have broken down and I'm warned that my microphone will. So if I go quiet, just say we can't hear you and somebody will pass me a microphone. Anyway. You see there's um, an awful plane going over at the moment, so we Yes, we've got everything yeah. going. It is live, it is live, <laughs> quite. Um, let's just remind you what happened to the blue tits about um, an hour earlier than this yesterday. It was pretty scary. There they are in their box, or rather, take my word for it, there they are in their box. Great spotted woodpecker pokes its head through and it does surprise people, perhaps, but great spotty woodpeckers will take young birds. I mean, once they got a bit bigger, they're probably safe, but there's no doubt whatsoever if the um, adult, who's one of the mum, mum or the dad, came in and chased them away, then they wouldn't be here today. This and the good news here. is 
This is the live pictures. Yes, folks, they are alive. And, and they we have are counted very well. all seven of them, haven't we? Today? We have. I bet people it's at home are going, what is it? Well, yeah, I know. Mm. How, can, we, can we see them very clearly? They haven't opened their eyes yet, but I'm bound to say that. It's probably I, a good job. Oh, oh, Mum's in and feeding. Say, yeah. Great. They can, they can hear her coming, but any noise. Actually, I noticed, this is quite interesting, that when the woodpecker shoved its head through, they didn't respond by opening their mouths which shows they can tell the difference, because they couldn't see. They yeah. really couldn't see. If they'd seen the woodpecker stick so its beak through. it was a total through. instinct just to, uh, to I lie don't know whether it's an instinct or is it noise or something. Do they hear, you know, a woodpecker um, noise is different from mum's noise. She didn't make much, actually, because she's got a big fat caterpillar in her beak now, at the moment. Um, Sorry to interrupt, you but can. I right. wanted to just say we have been banging on about how beautiful this farm is, but we are slightly conscious that you haven't really seen very much of it. So earlier today, when it was actually rather greyer than it is now, I set about to remedy that. A guided tour, here she goes. I thought I'd give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the farm so that you can get an idea of the context of everything, where the nest boxes are, and a little sneak preview of some of our future stars. This building behind me with the thatched roof is the barn and here with these funny drapes is the shed. That's where Bill and I are looking at the monitors all the time. And these buildings here are great for nesting birds. We've got doves, house martins, house sparrows and come through here and just peek through. There's a camera there and we're actually filming a swallow building a nest at the moment so hopefully we'll see them a bit later in the series. If you walk past those outbuildings, you come to this beautiful patch of woodland. Now, this is a successful and profitable farm, but it also works well for wildlife because they've kept hedgerows, open spaces, and they manage the woodlands like this. Now, just down there are our blue tits. The jackdaws are tucked away behind me there, and deep in the woods there are the badgers, which obviously I can't show you because we'll never see them again. This is the sort of feeder forest, and we've got lots of different feeders up, all with different things, peanuts, uh, sunflower seeds, that sort of thing, which will attract in different birds. And this one has got a camera on it. And over here, this extraordinary looking contraption is bird bath cam. Two views, one from here, and this one. Ever wanted to know what a bird's undercarriage looks like? Well, this is the camera for you. And to make sure that we bring you the very best footage of all this fantastic wildlife, we've brought in 50 cameras, 50 kilometres of cable, over 100 people, and, well, we've unquestionably moved in. This is home for the next three weeks. Did you, did you realise that you got a stunning shot of siskins there? I, I did, You did? Actually. Well, why yeah. didn't you say so, then? They well, wanted to know, know what I they thought were. I'd let you say it afterwards. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's so kind and slightly patronising. That's what she's there for. OK, yeah, those little stripy birds on the feeders were siskins. Gorgeous little finches. Um, I want to make a serious point here about the countryside and farming and so on and so forth. When we think about it, you know, what we think of as countryside in Britain is 90%, I think it's 80% literally, farmland. You know, mm -hmm. it's not wild areas. And we've seen all these statistics, all these figures, everybody must have seen them on the telly, in the papers, etc., etc. Farmland birds diminishing, 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 we're losing flowers, we're losing butterflies. On farmland. This is true, undeniably so. But it is not the farmer's fault. Because I think it's all too easy, you know, to jump to that conclusion, oh, the farmers are doing that. It's not. A farmer is there to produce food. This is an industry. They have to make a profit. They are not, in that sense, you know, naturalists. There's no reason why. And I sometimes think it's the old, um, the old image of Farmer Giles, you know, who knows absolutely everything in the old kids' books and that sort of thing. Fortunately, many, many farmers these days are doing the right thing and they're being paid to do it, which is more to the point. Things like the um, concern management and all that sort of thing. This is the farm for it. Come down here, go to a proper farm, it's fantastic. And you can Here's see jackdaws. Here's the proof. In a box. Here's the proof, yes. <laughs> jackdaws thriving around it. Although it has to be said, there weren't that many in this area um, not very long ago when they started to census the birds here. Um, there weren't many jackdaws, largely because the trees in the wood are not that old and they haven't got lots of holes. Which is why these boxes are really doing a great job of bringing jackdaws back. They presumably. are. I d I'm not sure people realise that, that, that uh, jackdaws would go into boxes, but these guys don't know. They're very dozy at the moment, they but I think they're alive and well. And you can see those enormous beaks, which, if the mum comes in with food, will 
open up feed me <laughs> should we go back to the blue tits see how they're getting you on? can't get enough of them can we, you basically i can't i love them and what i've really noticed is they've got a lot more feathers I and mean, yes. even from yesterday they they look like they've kind of progressed and grown they they have although i have to say that it's to me the second week when you really will notice this, you know, well, you'll be here next week. I will. Well, I hope so. I hope I <laughs> I'll will. I'll try and stick around. you will be too. <laughs> but, right next week, that's the week when it's an astonishing thing. Every time you come back, you can almost see the feathers growing. You know, at this stage, they're still blind. They still look very, very young. But next week, I, it's astonishing. It really is. Now, can we just go back? Because um, yesterday you said that there was something we could put on yeah. their box that yeah. would protect them. Yes, um, there it is. There it is, yeah. That's that little metal screen or shield I suppose you can call it around there. So this is sort of an anti woodpecker device? It is, although it has to be said that um, Great Spotted Woodpecker, if it wants to get in there, it will get in there. They've, uh, we've seen it hammering at the bottom, you know, yeah. of the box. We're just hoping that's not going to happen. We might end up having to reinforce the whole flipping box. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, they have an ambition, these little fellas. Yeah. They wish to grow up. They wish to turn into this and <laughs> <laughs> this is the seed in another nest box. There's so, so an many. Amazing family, this. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, we, we, we can guess at 11, but there could be more crushed in I under think there. last count was 11 youngsters, and it's obviously a very good year for blue tits. Last year was a very poor year for blue tits, and they only had one small brood. They can sense when there isn't enough food, but this year, as I'm sure all gardeners, people who have been out the country, know. Everything's green, lots of insects around, and there's a lot of food, and the birds think, great, big family. Big family, yes. and they and look very healthy to get indeed. Them all to, yes, to get them all to this stage is pretty amazing, actually, you know, because they just snuff it if they don't get enough food. So those guys will be leaving very, very soon, leaving our babies to grow up and leave in the third week, we hope. Right. Badgers. Badgers, OK, What's here we go. The badgers? Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still early, and it is very sunny. It's, it's only quarter yeah. past eight, not quite. Yeah. Um, and uh, they are staying very firmly underground. I wouldn't, e I wouldn't expect them to be out at this time on a sunny evening. But we have got some film from the last couple of days, well, tape from the last couple of days, and some lovely action here. That's two, two youngsters having a fight. See their little fluffy tails? This is brilliant. Watch <laughs> this. In comes the third one. Now, the one in the middle is getting a bit of a bully in here, if you know. Look, they keep he sort of... He is, actually, yeah, isn't he? Exactly. And he does look a lot smaller than the other yeah. two. Do you think he's a, probably a runt? I, I, I hate that word, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Runty badger. He's a, he's a rough little runt, but he ain't half getting it here. Yeah. And this is great. Watch this, because it goes... Uh, there's somebody digging. I don't know who that one is. <laughs> it, but the, the little runt, he says, oh, Look, Lord, Mummy! Mum, mummy, save me! Bear his mum. It oh, literally climbs that. on Mum's lap. Literally saying, yeah. protect yeah. me, I need but a But wait, hunt. wait. She's not that sympathetic. <laughs> <laughs> You're fantastic. <laughs> like, Go on. sort out your own Absolutely. battles. You know, it's oh. big lad. Don't come whinging to me, otherwise well, we won't we'll let you out. We'll hope, out. obviously, to bring you live bad, bad, badger action it's a little bit later on. Well it's done, not, yeah. Live um, badger action. But let's go back to Simon at Bass Rock. How are you doing over there, Simon? <laughs> Really, really well over here, Kate. It's a glorious evening, a little bit bracing, but um, absolutely stunning. So much activity going on. Oh, look, behind me now. A little bit of display from a couple of the birds. Bass Rock is just a little way away from mainland Scotland, 25 miles away from Edinburgh, and yet host to 40,000 pairs of gannet. But in that throng, we've been concentrating on just a couple of families, among them the Lighthouse pair and the Braveheart pair. And this evening, the female of the Braveheart pair is in attendance. She's just behind me here, across to the right. And that's a good thing, because if they leave the nest site, despite the fact this is a very young pair, they don't have an egg yet, if they leave the nest site, they could easily lose tenancy of that patch of ground. Another pair would move in and knock them out of the way. So it's very important that at least one of them hangs around for some of the time. We haven't seen the male for a while, but um, that's not surprising. He's probably off fishing, doing something like that, or cleaning up. Now, their relationship is also probably quite fresh. They're young birds. It may have kicked off last year, but it may have only kicked off at the beginning of this season. They haven't got an egg, as I say, so they're definitely in the infancy of their relationship. But um, we did see something happen earlier today that, uh, well, it was fairly concrete proof that their relationship was going quite well. That's them on the left-hand side there, and... 
beautiful bit of display. That's a reasonable sign, but gannets display to each other a lot like that, a bit of bill fencing. But there's no confusing what they're up to now. In fact, mating in gannets is quite a rough and protracted affair. That foot paddling is supposed to be a stimulus for the female. Looks a bit rough to me, same as the nape bite, but nonetheless, this is how they do it. And despite very regular sessions of mating throughout the course of the season, this pair is unlikely to have an egg this year. It's all just part of the pair bonding exercise. Now we've also been keeping an eye on a neighbouring pair, that's this pair here, where my finger is, that's the lighthouse pair. And we're pretty certain, in fact I'm absolutely certain, that that's the male of the pair. He's been on since yesterday evening when we were on air. He's been sitting on that nest and <laughs> yesterday he was absolutely pristine and white. And now look at the state of him. He has got pretty messy neighbours, as you can see. Um, they share the incubation gannets and each of them takes turns on the nest, often over 30 hours on the nest at a time. And that's hardly surprising because there are over 80,000 gannets on this island. They consume over 200 tonnes of fish a day, and so they're unlikely to find all of that fish on the doorstep. They have to go a long way to find it. Up to 540 kilometres has been recorded. That's 330 miles for a fishing trip. And they can cover an area of the North Sea that's the equivalent of England and Scotland put together. Quite an extraordinary trip. So it's hardly surprising that they hang around on the nest for long periods and have to be quite patient. When they do come back to the nest, they very often bring a little bit of nesting material, usually in the form of seaweed, but uh, sometimes they come in with bits and bobs that are rather less suitable. We recorded this a day or so ago. That's the standard sort of material you'd expect a gannet to bring in. But they can't resist that impressive piece of furniture. The truth is that's not going to be any use to a gannet's nest. They build pillars which are made out of muck and seaweed that end up as, as little mounds within the colony. And so a stick like this will go from bird to bird through the colony, beak to beak, and probably end up being chucked out on the other side. They are beautiful birds, they're impressive, but I have to say they're quite probably a little bit stupid. <laughs> There's all sorts going on in the colony behind me right now. I've got a bird. Let me see if I can do this. If I can come, I've got one balanced on my hand here. Can we get that? There we go. I'll do a little bit of gannet tipping. Three, two, one. This is the launch pad. My left hand is the launch pad. The birds come here just before they have to head off to sea. Here we go. Three, two, one, and. Oh, it's alright, it's too heavy. <laughs> Back in the beginning of the year, just when the gannets were starting to come to this island and, and fill up the colony, I had the privilege of visiting a secret location, and that was to see not a bird, but another of uh, Britain's most spectacular wild animals. And that was in a really rather remarkably unusual setting. I'm in the heart of one of Britain's busiest cities, thank you. Not the best place to watch wildlife? Well, even here, there is a retreat where you can find a bit of peace and quiet. Cemeteries are real oases for wildlife. Every city has them, and you expect to find birds nesting, perhaps even foxes in the cemetery. But this particular graveyard has a real jewel in its crown.
There they are. Roe deer. Now that is certainly not an animal you expect to find in an inner city cemetery. <laughs> this is just incredible. Quite normally, I'd have to be careful of the wind direction, I'd have to be completely hidden, not moving at all, and keeping my distance. Here, these animals are bomb-proof. I can talk, in fact, I can talk in a normal voice. I'm so used to whispering around deer, it's ridiculous. And I can talk in a normal voice, they're not even looking at me. Quite a mature buck, this. Really old roe deer tend to hold their necks out quite low. They've got big, heavy necks, quite grizzled-looking faces. I'd say he was maybe four or five years old, this one. The fact that he has a, a doe with him, a female, means they certainly are breeding here. And there's the male's bottom. It's a very, very clear way of telling male and female rodeo apart. The male has a kidney-shaped white patch and the female's much more heart-shaped and out of the bottom of it, a little white tuft. Some people call it a tush. We know that there are two roe deer in this cemetery, but it's hard to work out just how they got here. The whole place seems to be surrounded by the city. There is a railway quite close by and railways are traditionally highways for wildlife. The rough ground either side of the track used by lots of animals, deer included, through the course of the night. And suddenly they find themselves bang smack in the middle of an urban sprawl. It's quite extraordinary. Foxes are regulars here too. They're no threat to the adults, but they could kill a fawn. Foxes may be one reason why people rarely see any fawns here. But for the adult deer, this is obviously a place worth defending against others. Oh, lovely. That buck is just getting territorial. You're not simply making a mess of the garden here. He's leaving very distinctive scent marks. To other males, it'll say, keep out. And to females, welcome ladies. However, I can't imagine that they get a lot of passing radio traffic through here. <laughs> nice hat. <laughs> Gotta tell you, fella, you look a bit of a twitch now. <laughs> so, dear one, dead weeds, nil. something incredibly touching about these very wild, normally highly strung animals behaving so peacefully in a cemetery. Not normally a very spiritual person, but wasn't it? It's got a funny atmosphere here. It's very lovely. That has to be the most extraordinary encounter I have ever had with wild roe deer. And it's all thanks to this island of calm in a sea of concrete and noise. Just goes to show that wild animals and human beings really can live side by side, so long as there's an atmosphere of acceptance and space for the wild creatures to find that little bit of peace when they need it. Okay, now, 
uh, this, this, this is live, this is busking it. Somebody in my ear up there says there's a roe deer on the badger. Can that. this be true? Yes, it can be true. <laughs> extraordinary. It's not on a badger's head, I don't know where it is. It's, it's nicking food from the farm, I think. Well, there we are, folks. Absolutely there we are, folks. amazing. Now, that's, you know, you have to be my age to remember things like this. There's some advantages to it, because, I mean, like this lovely idyllic scene here. I mean, it was like this every night when I was a kid, just about everywhere. <laughs> whole of the middle of Birmingham where I lived looked like this. <laughs> the, the mayflies <laughs> buzzing around the irises and stuff like that. And the only thing, though, that I have to say is, um, I didn't see a roe deer for a very, very, very long time. I was really getting on when I saw my first roe deer. Well, I have to say, I've been very lucky in seeing a lot of them, particularly around Wiltshire. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the 70s, they were in serious decline, um, but they are an animal that respond very well to protection. They are now protected. And, um, you know, numbers have really grown, and you are very likely to see them in Scotland and the south of England. Few are creeping into the middle of England. Yes. But um, if you hang around outside woodlands very early in the Morning. Well, I often do. <laughs> I've hung around outside woodlands in, on Hampstead Heath and I haven't yet seen a road yet. But you are absolutely right. It's a success story without a doubt. Because I say, when I was a kid, I never saw them. And I think it's only the last 10, 15 years. Every time I go in the countryside, I see road deer. I hope you do too. Now, before you do your roundup, I'm what? going to run away. Yeah. Because I'm going to go and see some bugs. I'll see you in a bit. She's got a, actually, it's because she's got a big steep hill and she can't cut it. I can be up there in 10 seconds, but it takes her ages. Let's have a quick look at what's happening um, at the nest. So I'm just being sent the pictures. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? You see, when I'm not in control of the nest, this is what they do. They just send me a picture of a blackbird showing its bum, basically. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> she heard, you see, just to show the babies there. This is actually the second nest. That and we think that probably grey squirrels took the youngsters. They are very vulnerable, as you can imagine, to squirrels, you know. Um, a squirrel can't really get into a nest box, but it can certainly get to an open nest. So let's go to the jackdaws, please. Where are they? That's not the jackdaws. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> sorry, that sounded ever so patronising. Ooh, sorry, producer. Um, there's the jackdaws looking very sleepy. I must admit, nothing's doing much, is it, tonight? really isn't. So, um, I, d I don't think they're going to do anything at all. I know what we're going to do. I know what we're going to do. I want to show you the pictures. Remember, earlier in the programme, Kate showed you the feeder area, yeah? And the, and the bath and the big distorted face. That was hers on the camera. So, let's have a look what the birds look like from those weird cameras. This is, this is feeder cam, this one. And there's one of our robins. We had a family of robins, which like so many of our, but oh, oh dear, I was going to say the robins fledged and weren't on the telly. Yes, might well. That's the woodpecker that's been having a go at the booties. That's the goldfinch. Lovely picture of the goldfinch there. And this is this rather weird view from wide angle lens underneath the, um, the bath. Lovely green finch there. And that <laughs> green finch from very strange angle collecting, I think, I don't know, that's food or nesting material and oh flipping heck what now that's like an emu isn't it it's a tribute to rod hull bless him god rest his soul um not quite sure what that was are you can, it, this, can we have an action replay as it were of that not very lovely thing it's 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 a robin well, I'm sorry, I don't think that robin is going to thank us for showing himself to millions of people. That's a robin. I don't know what's happened to it. Apparently, it's been coming into the feeder. I'd heard this was coming. I didn't know it looked like that. So that's the state that some of these birds can actually get into. Um, right, yes. Kate said she was going to look for bugs. And, in fact, there's a rather extraordinary initiative launched by the RSPB. You may have seen this in the papers. It's very weak. It's called the Big Bug Count. And you get one of these things and you stick it on the radiator of your car and then you can judge how many bugs, and that means, that means moths and so on and so forth, are actually sticking to those cars. And it's not as daft as it sounds because time was, and I remember this again very well, oh, when I used to go motoring in the horseless carriage, and we used to get the the um, windscreen absolutely covered, covered in bugs. And frankly, that's not happening quite so much. And we want to know why, because that will also explain the decrease in some of the birds that feed on those bugs. So, creepy crawlies, that's the subject. Kate? 
If you were watching yesterday, you'll know that we're on a bit of a mission. We're asking you to help preserve Britain's wildlife by making space for nature. Yesterday I showed you some bird boxes that you could put up to provide homes for nesting birds and today it's the turn of some of our smaller residents. Now this may look like a wood pile to you but this is a veritable mansion for all sorts of creatures. Wood mice would love this, so would hedgehogs and if you just have a dig around, let me just tip this up and see what we've got under here. Everything's lurking and being very shy. Oh, there we are. We've got a couple of wood lice there. Looks straight out of Jurassic Park. Now you may be wondering why on earth you would want to give a home to a creepy crawly like this. Well, not only do they provide food for birds and for mammals, but they also will reward you richly for their new home because these are kind of the dustbin men of the garden. They'll take your garden waste and turn it into nutritious food for your soil and make your garden grow. So that can only be a good thing. The other thing that you can do, or you may have already done, is have a compost heap. Now, compost heaps, are, as we all know, are great things and you don't have to go and spend money on expensive fertiliser. But look at this. Now that may say to you, hmm, it's just a compost heap. No, this is the perfect home for two of Britain's rarest creatures, slow worms and grass snakes. Compost heap is a haven for them. It will keep them safe and warm and moist and you can feel very happy that you're providing a home for something quite so rare. Now if you do think you can make space for nature, let us know call us on 08700 100 160 or go to the website bbc.co.uk forward slash nature. Over 3,000 of you pledged yesterday, which is just fantastic. And what we'd like to do is give you a total at the end of the series of how many of you have made space for nature and what sort of impact we can expect that to have on our wildlife. Oh, and just a quick note, some people called to say that you had already put up bird boxes, but we will be giving you a different idea every day on how you can help and join our campaign. Campaign. So go on, make space for nature because it's really easy and it really will make a difference. Welcome back to the east coast of Scotland where the rain has passed, the sun has come out and I am in heaven. I'm out on the Bass Rock surrounded by over 80,000 gannets. I've moved a little way away from the edge of the breeding colony to the western end of the island and uh, I'm looking at a group of birds here which may not look very different from the birds that were behind me just now. But when you look a little closer, you'll begin to see that the spacing behind, between a lot of these birds is irregular, unlike the main part of the breeding colony. And in fact, what I'm looking at here is not breeding birds, it's called the club. It's a huge mob of immature and non-breeding birds that have all gathered together to hang around on the island. Now I can tell a lot of these birds are young because of their plumage. When a gannet starts life it's, it's more or less black all over and that helps prevent aggression from other birds including their own parents when they begin to leave the nest and go on walkabout. Then as the years pass they begin to get more and more of their white feathers until they're fully adult and they just have black feathers on their wingtips. So this bird we're looking at now, that's probably, that's quite a young bird, that's maybe a, in its second year, maximum third year bird. And there are others in the group which just have a, a few black feathers in their wings. Now why should they be hanging around here? They're not breeding, they should be off fishing you'd think. Well, they've got a lot to learn and so they spend an enormous amount of time within the colony looking at how to deal with social situations, the displays they have to get used to doing throughout the course of their breeding life, which could be 30 years or more. And they're also learning about how the wind affects the island, where they can take off, where they can land, and ultimately where they can nest. Now, they may visit this colony for many years before they finally settle down and even think about breeding like our Braveheart couple that don't have an egg yet, but they're nonetheless already staking a claim on a patch of ground. Let's see what's going on behind us here. Quite a lot of birds are involved in courtship displays. 
Yeah, there's one now. Lovely. Now, those aren't breeding birds, but they are nonetheless bill fencing, and that's a clear sign that they're starting to strike up a relationship. This is, a, this is love in its infancy, if you like. Now, when all of these birds finally choose to nest, you'll think that perhaps there's no room for any other birds on Bass Rock. And that's almost true, but there are some other species. Further down on the ramparts, there are guillemots, there are razorbills, there are even a few fulmars and shags. A handful of puffins are also on the bass, but if you really want to see puffins well, then you have to make a short hop to the nearby Isle of May. That's something I had the chance to do just a few days ago. Just eight and a half nautical miles away from the Bass Rock and all of those gannets is the island of May. This is the site of a vast colony of arguably Britain's most popular bird because it's here that well over a hundred thousand puffins nest. It's a ridiculous flight. They seem to have wings that are only barely able to keep them up in the air, very skinny wings. And so they have to flap, beat really, really rapidly to remain airborne. And yet they cover massive distances when they go off to find fish. So it must be efficient. Three more, four more. Wow, they're piling in now. They are just so endearing. And what a neat trick. That bird has oh, five or six sand eels in its beak. Now, think about it. There you are, swimming under the ocean. You've already got four sand eels in your mouth. How on earth do you catch your fifth? In fact, puffins have a rather neat trick. Their tongue is serrated, and so is the roof of their mouth. So, Every single fish they catch, they trap it between the tongue and the upper mandible, and then they are free to snap at the next one. The puffins on May are a real success story. In 1959, 1960, a count was done, and there were five pairs here. That's 10 birds. Now. 63,000 pairs, 68,000 pairs, no, nearly 70,000 pairs. That's astonishing. There's so much more noise and bustle here on the bass compared to the Isle of May. I imagine it's considerably less noisy and smelly down there on the farm. <laughs> I don't know, actually. <laughs> a few cows and sheep and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, it's funny how often, actually, some, and this is absolute coincidence, you know, we see an item like that, and here in the papers this very morning, again, you may have read this, um, is seabirds' population rise down to cod's decline? Try and ignore the small plane going over the moment. And what that means is it, nothing is simple, because the theory is that there are more puffins and more guillemots, they're doing really, really well, because there are more and more little fish, like the sprats and the sand eel. But maybe there are more little fish because there are less of the big fish, the cod and so on and so forth, because they may well have been overfished. You know, this, this balance thing all the time, as soon as you introduce man into it, which you have to do, let's face it, you run the risk of it all it's going It's very, on. very tricky. It is tricky. There's very always tricky. two sides. I don't like sort of saying, oh, it's black and white. Never is. Never no. is. Except the no. puffin, which is black and white. <laughs> With colours. Apart from the colour bit. Yes. 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 <laughs> um, now, I would like to go back to Scotland, oh, if we may. Yes. Not to Simon, but um, you may remember yesterday that uh, we showed you a film shot by a specialist cameraman called John Aitchison, great friend of Bill's, um, a film of a family of otters, and we left them in the teeth of a terrible storm. Did they survive? Let's find out. The storm had been blowing for days. It could easily have killed the otters. That was the last time I'd seen them fishing in these enormous waves. I have no idea if they're alive. The storm's wiped the slate clean. It feels like I'm starting again trying to find them. There's no guarantee they're even alive at all.
I love going along near the shore like this. It feels like I'm learning the landscape from the otter's point of view. If they have survived, I know where I'm going to have to look. I'm going to go straight there. This beach has got just the right sort of sand, and it might just hold a clue to where they are. since the tide was up here. So that family of otters is just out there somewhere. Ah, great. And she's got something. She's bringing it. Ah, look, she's keeping it. That is interesting. So things are changing for this cub. The mother's not feeding it anymore. That is interesting writings on the wall, really. It's being told in no uncertain terms that it's going to have to look after itself. It's going to have to catch its own food from now on. She's making it independent, really. She'll stick with it for a while, I'm sure, and she's going to be there to look after it and take it to the right places, but the cub's really going to have to catch its own fish. <laughs> So it looks like this cub's going to have to become self-sufficient. But that's going to be difficult for me, because I'm going to have trouble keeping track of it. But then the gulls can help. They're a really good clue as to where an otter's fishing. They're like a flag. There it is. These next few months will be crucial for this young otter. As the spring arrives, its life is going to change completely. Certainly got a lot to learn. I wonder what will happen. When the sedge warblers arrive, you know summer's nearly here. It feels like such a different place now. It's May and there's new colours everywhere and all the summer birds are here calling. New life everywhere. I want to find out how the cub's doing, what's changed in the otters' lives. No footprints today. Ah, who's this? It's on its own, it's not the cub. It's the male. That is interesting. He's very purposeful. What he's doing? He's checking out his territory, I suppose. He must be looking for scent, I think. And in that case, maybe he's trying to find a female. Which might mean that she's in season. Ah, there's the mother and cub. Ah, now, if she is in season, that's probably bad news for that cub. Because its life's about to change. Good. It's feeding itself. That's fantastic. It's going to have to do this now. As soon as there's new cubs around, this one's going to have to go off on its own. But it's a year old now. It's ready to go. I'm so glad to see it fishing for itself. I'm so lucky living here. I really feel like it's a privilege to share this place with the otters feel the same storms, we go through the same seasons together. We're really part of the same community. And this cub looks like a survivor to me. I think it's doing fine. It's catching its own food. It doesn't really need its mum anymore. I think we're going to be neighbours for quite a long time to come. We've both been learning about this place, the cub and me. We're both pretty lucky to call this place home. Yeah.
happy ending indeed. Yeah, good news for John and his badgers, and indeed, good news. Badgers, badgers is otters. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell, you know. Give me, correct me. Um, you know, the good news also for otters in the south, not just in Scotland, because cleaner waterways have meant that the otters are making a pretty remarkable comeback. And any of you have been reading, as I certainly had, that mink were a big problem, mink that have escaped or been released. Um, in oh. fact, the, um, the, be the otters are much more so dominating. Are you going to... You're going I'm to sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting. We've got a badger She's live. She's interrupting. Have we you had got a badger live. Oh, can you see that? <laughs> oh yes, you have. Oh, we've got Look several that. come out. Oh, oh no, don't disappear. Look at that. Well, that's that's fantastic. It is, is ten to nine. Ten, to, yeah. And um, this is very early on a sunny evening like this. This really is. Because I mean, if we were down there now, we would have to make sure that the wind wasn't blowing towards them because they've got a very good sense of smell. Yeah. We would have to make sure that we made no noise because they have fantastic sense of hearing, but in fact their eyesight is not good at all. Now, the reason that this picture is black and white is because we're on infrared cameras. We've got six cameras set up around the badger set and um, this is what's giving us these fantastic views. Look at that. What Isn't when this wonderful? We've got about five or six cameras. I don't know why we're whiffing, because we're miles away. But, that's <laughs> but you kind of want to, don't Let's do it, let's do it. Yeah. One, two, three, four. So that's probably the three youngsters and the mum. It's hard to tell the youngsters until they turn around, because it's the fluffy tails that they give away, because they're getting as big. Um, I don't know, we've also got microphones down there. I have no yeah. idea whether if we oh, just... Oh, something's, oh, something's happening. Something. That was noise. I bet that was a noise. Because I remember, let's see if we can hear. I can't hear any noise of them at all. We're obviously not hearing what I hope you at home are hearing, which is the snuffling. And that was an amazingly quick reaction. Well, they do. Just I've seen that happen myself. I, I remember, you know, just hearing a twig break, and they'd be away. And yet, they can recognise natural noises because if a wood pigeon, for example, goes through, they clap their wings. They go, yeah, like that, and they won't move they won't react to that as if they say that's fine that's a natural noise you know if a if an owl goes if a fox barks anything like that they don't mind that that must be one of the cubs in the foreground here a little fluffy I think he's got a fluffy enough tail i there. think yeah no i think he has they're, they're actually feeding fairly desperately at the moment rather than than playing they the things they do is come out as soon as it there's Come something, back. Uh, is there something the great thing again some of these cameras about three of That's them right. can move around can pan and tilt and move around as you're seeing there so um can we can we zoom in on that one or is that not a zoom and all camera we just want to do oh, the trick oh, 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 what's oh, going on what's maybe going it on? heard the camera you never know it may have just heard that there we are, i don't think so i don't think so it's really, it's fantastic. It's, actually. it's wonderful. It's maybe because it. it was a bit damp and cold earlier, and this is actually, it's warmer now. Well, it's that sort of celebration of all, yeah. you know, the sun's out, probably a bit like us, you know, the sun's out, we'll, we'll come out. It, it always amazes me that they have these enormous paws and these huge jaws, and yet they don't need them in a sense, you know, not to find food, because they, they're feeding on earthworm worms or just the odd little... Um, seeds even. You know, they don't go for big animals. And can you believe that they're members of the weasel family? I know, I know. I read that the other day. I didn't know that. You didn't know that just like that, did you? No, I didn't. No, I read it too. <laughs> <laughs> I was but it just really I know, if you'd me. guessed, you'd think they were some kind of related to pigs or something. Oh, look, something going on. Dig well, it is, it? Digging away. Well, yeah. there's something like 20 odd holes around this badger set. There are miles, well, not literally miles, but there were yards and yards of tunnels. There's many, many um, little caverns and, and um, you know, caves, as it were, underneath the ground there. So well, let's, um, we'll keep an eye on these. Let's go back to Simon say, on Bass Rock. Bass Simon, rock. I wish you were here. I wish you could see these badgers. You would, your life would be complete. It is so lovely to see badgers live and just as they're starting to come out down in Devon, so things are starting to wind down a little bit here on the Bass Rock on the east coast of Scotland. But there still is a heck of a lot of noise going on all around me. Not everybody's asleep by a very long way. A lot of the noise that's generated in a gannet colony is created by birds that are coming or going. 
as they begin to land they have their mouths open and they create this garrulous call <laughs> and they do a funny strangled call as they take off and any display is accompanied by a lot of vocalization it has to be said though when they come and when they go they're often not very good at it the truth is they're pretty rubbish at landings and takeoff Now they're heavy birds, they've got quite weak flight muscles compared to their size and they've got very long narrow wings so they need a strong wind, a long wrap or if they're on the cliffs they can just drop away to get airborne. But the colony here on the Bass Rock it's spread up and over onto the flat ground so these birds that are nesting in the flat areas just have to run the gauntlet of beaks to try and get airborne. It's quite an ordeal, and there are a lot of near misses as well. Nope, <laughs> that's got to hurt. <laughs> Even landing is tricky here, particularly when there are low winds, because as a gannet slows down, it loses its ability to be manoeuvrable in the air, and it effectively just drops out of the sky. Again, they have to battle through the beaks to reach their mate and uh, reaffirm their relationship with a bit of bill fencing. Now. Braveheart and the Lighthouse family both are on the edge of the colony, so it's starter homes, but at least they have a pretty good nest launch pad, or rather takeoff launch pad, which is just behind me here, this big rock. And uh, so I suppose from that point of view, it's quite a des res. If you're nesting this next to a high rock, then you've got a good takeoff pad, you're not going to get beaten up by the neighbours. But don't be fooled into thinking that gannets are just not good on the wing. That's far from the truth. Once they get up to speed, they are incredibly manoeuvrable, they have tremendous stamina, and there's no way to see that any better than when they're out and fishing. Now, earlier in the week, I followed them out to sea and got a taste of their true ability. is the heavyweight plunge diving champion of the world doing what it does best. Everything about the gannet is designed for a precision strike on its fish prey. From its binocular vision, it's able to pinpoint the slightest flash from an incredible height. And then it begins that powered descent, sometimes from as high as 30 meters or more, to hit the surface of the water at perhaps over 100 kilometers an hour. That's 60 miles an hour or more. It's a phenomenal impact. Any other bird would fall apart under the pressures of that dive, but not the gannet. It has a specially reinforced skull, strength and neck vertebrae, air sacs in its neck, and a beak that doesn't have any visible nostril. It looks like a spear, it is a spear, and its sole purpose is grabbing that fish. They eat a tremendous amount of fish, and as a consequence, they do a tremendous amount of this. I just got a direct hit. <laughs> Occupational hazard, I don't mind at all. It's part of being on the Bass Rock, and this is a tremendous experience. Have a quick look at what's going on with our families. Lighthouse family, female still on the nest, no sign of the male, but even just being there, preening, she's making her mark. She's making a point that nobody else can occupy that patch of ground. And as far as the lighthouse family is concerned, same thing, the male, looking pretty scruffy. He certainly needs a wash and I'm sure he's looking forward to his mate returning. She's been away for well over 40, yeah, 40 hours now, so tomorrow there should be a changeover. That's about all we have time for here on the Bass Rock, so I'll say goodbye. How's it going down on the farm? <laughs> oh, it's, look, that is gorgeous. Oh, those fishing shots were amazing. I've, I've got to say, there's some very, very beautiful scenes up there. The silhouettes yeah. and everything, that's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. It does strike me how much difference there is. You know, when you see the activity in a colony up there, because 
it's going to be light for a couple of hours yet, you know. Whereas here, it's getting downright dusky oh, out there. Tits. It's definitely bedtime, and there's Scruff the Booty, <laughs> or looking, Scruff Mr. Booted, or scruffy. Mrs. Scruffy. They're looking worse every day. <laughs> but I'm happy they're still there. Um, Great Spotted Woodpeck is lurking around, but they seem fine. And she's cleaning up the nest here to make sure there's no parasites or ticks or anything like that, because they could do the serious damage as well. Jackdaws so are still Jack looking doors. sleepy. They, they frankly haven't worked not for hours. I was hoping they were going to do their screechy old noise, but they're, they're not. They were flexing their wings earlier, so they're getting there slowly, but uh, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're not the most looking, photogenic, are they're, they're, they're not gorgeous, are they? <laughs> However, Let's what is back. photogenic? I can't believe this. The badgers Luckily, are still there. The still badgers there. are still there. Very this active. Life. Been a lot of digging going on, a lot well, of sort of rooting around. Exactly. Well, I mean, that precisely what those great big claws are for is for digging and obviously digging digging and when you stand outside a badger set it is amazing because it really does look as though you know the builders have been in and yeah. there's a great big it's pile huge earth moving yeah, yeah. machines have been in it is incredible and and if you didn't know i think you'd probably think that was the case you know if you didn't know what you were looking for and I think what's so amazing is, is, you know, what you were saying before about the size of these sets. You know, there may not be a huge number of badgers, but there might be 20 holes. Look Wait a minute. Well, there's five. Hang on. We've, uh, we've been looking at one. Uh, <laughs> there's th there's there five, five there. Five there. And we've had three youngsters and one mother, so we've presumably got mum and dad or possibly somebody from would a previous have, generation. I was going to say, would you have young from the, from yes, the previous yeah, year still there? They are incredibly sociable and there can be as many as 15 badgers, something like that, down there and there will be previous years young, there will be an auntie and an uncle. It's a bit like elephants actually, rather the same thing. Yeah. You know, our equivalent to the elephant, nearest as we get. Would they um, boot out males as they get mature? Would they have to go off and set up their own family? Um, I presume eventually they do. Whether they literally get booted out, I don't know. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. I, I, th there'll be fighting to a certain extent. Some of that play fighting is bound to be males squaring up and yeah. saying, I'm the boss here. Yeah. But there's usually only one female with youngsters, and this is what we've got here. Well, it is such a treat. I can't believe we're seeing this live. Don't forget, if you would like to make space for nature, call us 08700 100 160 or go onto the website bbc.co.uk forward slash nature. The webcam will be up and running. You'll be able to watch these badgers until one o'clock this morning. Tomorrow, I get to go underwater. I'm glad to hear you. I'm not coming with you either. Look at that. It could be anybody. It could be anybody. <laughs> well, I'm afraid it is me. I don't see much more. Oh, there you are. That's there. That's a close up, lovely. Did you actually see that? Yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Okay, so we're going to leave you with, um, well, basically a very good day, actually. It's been very, very Fantastic productive. Day. It really has. But we've still got those little worries around. The great spotted woodpecker is still lurking around there. Could get to our youngsters. Um, Simon still has got 49,099 <laughs> gannets to name, and Braveheart certainly has to live up to its name because it's done nothing particularly spectacular so far. Anyway, join us tomorrow, 8, 8 o'clock, BBC Two. That's right. For when Britain, Britain goes, wild. goes wild. And us, and you. one chick in the nest to look after. Peregrines have a relatively easy job on their hands. The downside is they quite literally have all of their eggs in just the one basket. So should anything happen to this chick, well, all of the nesting efforts of the pair will have been in vain. Obviously, we sincerely hope that absolutely nothing untoward happens. I'll be back a little bit later to see what's going on and we'll be looking at some of the other residents in the quarry here. Bill. Am, am I 
framed in roses here. It looks like it from where the camera is. What a lovely conceit that is. Why does Simon always equate his birds with cars? I think the Gannets were Ferraris. What did he call the Peregrines? Formula One? Well, I think the blue tits are the, the Morris Miners of the bird world. And in this hedge here we have uh, what should it be? The Vauxhall Astra, a good old reliable blackbird, because the nest is in here. And I love this bit, by the way, round here. It's like a little garden, you know, because you've got a big farm out there, but this is just like any old garden, as it were. And uh, the guy's planted, the owner has planted a hawthorn hedge, and hawthorn is really, really good for wildlife. Make space for hawthorn in your garden, because it attracts lots of insects, it has a lovely May blossom on it, with lots of lovely legends about it, and it's great for birds' nests. So I'm not going to peer in there but um, the nest is in there this little camera over here is trained on the nest it can see it I can't you can so you tell me there's three big fat youngsters in there almost ready to go and sometimes the females with them sometimes the males with them are they there they are they there they are they're all right yes fine I've still gone quiet in my ear so I don't know so <laughs> <laughs> but the babies are fine. The babies have just got news just in. It's in my ear. Um, right. Follow the wires. These wires go out into the woods and it's not very far over there, a few hundred yards, where our badger set is. So um, I'm not going to traipse off down there. You can have a look on the camera if you like and I more or less guarantee there'll be nothing there. And would I look a fool if they were all romping about? <laughs> No, they're not there. But um, good news, they've been coming out earlier over the weekend, so we're going to have a look at that set soon. Here, this is the um, sort of feeding area with um, lots of feeders. More about them later. Anything? Oh, yes, we've got two birds on them, two blue tits. Can you get those? No, just silhouettes at this stage anyway. Don't worry what they are. Um, that's the interesting bit. This is the bird bath. I know it looks like an old tree stump because that's exactly what it is. So another good rule. Nice bit of recycling there. And we've got bird bath cam on there, giving you one sensible view of the bird bath and an extremely silly view from underneath, um, like a fisheye lens. I suppose it's a fisheye's view. Not that there's any fish in there, as far as I know. But there's been uh, plenty of takers for the bird bath, not just having a drink, but doing what it was there for, and um, to have a bath, that is. So let's have a bit of film of what's been going on. Just tape, tape, it's not film, is it? What's been going on at the bird bath cam? This terribly distorted creature is, <laughs> there he is, it's a squirrel. Just a normal squirrel seen from a rather unusual angle. Actually, we haven't seen many grey squirrels, and that may be one of the reasons the birds do so well over here. That's a nuthatch usually seen shinning up a tree at a great speed, which is a kind of woodpecker, if you like. But these, boo hiss, the one on the left is the wicked woodpecker that had a go at our blue tits, and the one on the right with the red cap, that's one of the youngsters, so she's obviously got at least one youngster. So that's rather good, isn't it? So, what's that? Oh, that's a woodpecker from underneath. You can see those stiff tail feathers there, having a good bath. And believe you me, it has been so flipping hot today, I felt like jumping in there with it. But I've seen what a woodpecker can do to a baby blue tit, and I'm not going to get in a bath with it, put it that way. <laughs> It'll be up my knee like a like a, a grey spotted woodpecker. I, I just yes. don't even want to think about the view. Uh, no, that, oh, that we would get. The camera? No, yes, no, no, no. no. Let's, don't go let's there. move on to something altogether nice. more pleasant. <laughs> um, we've had some lovely comments from you about the films, about the otters and stoats that we showed you last week. But not all animals have such obvious appeal. In fact, some might be well downright frightening. Have a look at this though, and it might change your mind. A British woodland in spring. Calm, relaxing, beautiful, totally unthreatening. Or is it? In fact, something scary is lurking in the undergrowth. The adder, Britain's only venomous creature. There is one person who knows nor shows any fear, who tracks down the adder wherever it goes. And that person is... Sylvia Sheldon. My interest in adders began 
in uh, the late 70s uh, when I became fascinated with these beautiful little creatures. My first adder, I realised what a beautiful little creature it was, much smaller than I was looking for. I was looking for something much bigger. I'm not a trained biologist. I seem to have uh, acquired uh, quite a bit of knowledge on the adders and their habits just through watching. I began by drawing adder patterns and head markings in here. August 79 and Rusty, I gave her a name later, was the first one I drew and turned out to be the first one of many adders I photographed and recorded over 25 years. I thought I would find two uh, the same, similar sometimes, but never identical. There is a lot of misconception about adder bites. Um, yes, they are Britain's only venomous snake, but their venom isn't intended for man. If man gets bitten, it's usually his own fault for picking them up and handling them roughly. If left alone, adders will never attack. They will always go into cover. So anyone walking is in no danger from being bitten by an adder. They should uh, not hear my approach. As long as my feet go down gently, softly, so I'm not causing any vibrations in the ground. It takes quite a lot of traipsing around to find them originally, but they're quite loyal to their, their basking spots once you find them. Ah, I see a shed skin. Extricate it very carefully. I don't want to rip it. That's uh, one I call BTT. He was a baby number two in 2000, so he's three and a half. Now I'll have a look in my in my book and get my little pack of photographs out. Uh, this male was a baby when I took that photograph. You can see his head marking has stayed exactly the apex of the zigzag has stayed exactly the same and it will do over his lifetime. They don't change at all. I think there'd be every possibility of the male basking somewhere. Ah, here he is. He's down there by the, the bit of a log in front of us. They do have the potential to live to a good age. Uh, the oldest female that I've seen in this area uh, was 28, but I haven't seen her for two years now. Adders have been declining in Britain for many years. And two years ago, I had a population of about 28 mature. And this year, I am down to um, 13. We're not quite sure the reason. There could be many reasons. So I am extremely concerned for the future of the adder. I'm always pleased when I can get photographs of baby adders because I always hope that I can follow them through to maturity and, uh, and possibly uh, see them mating with a female. I know the female will be carrying babies and know the parentage of them. And uh, It is very satisfying to be able to recognise them as they go through life. I feel very privileged to be living so close to the creatures I've become so fascinated with. The birds are singing. I can watch the adders. What more could one ask? Such oh, a lovely film, that. That is lovely. It's a lovely lady. Yeah. I mean, it's called me a little bit soppy, if you like, and many have. Um, but it's not just the wildlife. Some of the wildlife people are absolutely de delightful. Mind you, there's some terrible old boars as well, but we won't have them. <laughs> yes, I know. Shut up, Bill. Um, 
Um, Heathland, unfortunately, tends to be the home of the adder, and that's one of those areas that is really, really very, very sparse these days. Um, ironically, it was man-made when forests were cleared many years ago. Um, I mean, a long, long time ago, and then grazed and the heathland regenerated. But sadly, it's man who's also encroaching on it as well. And um, developments, things like that, are still threatening. Heathland is very special because it has creatures you just don't get anywhere else. A lovely green thing that's shot off. That's a woodlark, by the way. That was a um, sand lizard earlier on. Got to think back now. Smooth snake, I think we saw at the beginning of the film. <laughs> and uh, sadly, there aren't only these little vestiges of Heathland left. The secret is, and actually it is at least happening, is that very, very few of them aren't now official bird um, nature reserves, you know, not just birds, of course. And, and that seems to be the name of the game these days. It's not a matter of saving what's, you know, what's left. You've just got to actually make own it. it. You've got to own, it, reserve, it. Yeah. own it and manage it to yeah. make it the right way. Yeah. yeah, It's a complicated issue, sort of wildlife guarding on a grand scale. It is, it is. But um, something that has been preserved uh, is our lovely Simon King <laughs> and the peregrine falcons. <laughs> Be preserved. Welcome back to the quarry in the heart of England, home to the top gun of all birds, the peregrine falcon. Things have calmed down a little bit on the nest ledge now. One very happy, very full chick, about three and a half weeks old. Mum's just gone off for a bit of a wash and brush up, I think. If you are new to bird watching, or maybe you've never really considered birds interesting in any way, it may seem slightly odd that anybody could get excited about a bunch of feathers and fluff, but ever since I can remember, ever since I've been able to carry a pair of binoculars, I have been completely besotted with peregrines. Every opportunity as a kid, I would go to the coast in winter, and yeah, wading birds are fascinating, finches are great, but I'd always be looking out for that anchor-shaped silhouette against the sky of a peregrine falcon. And the moment one turned up on the scene, every single other bird in the area panic stations. Great flocks of waders would lift off and peregrine would come cleaving down through the flock, cutting it up, trying to get a meal. Blackbirds skulk, hide in bushes. You get starlings going up in great clouds, chipping away in alarm calls. Wherever they go, peregrines leave a wake of fear. But that is apart from here, because considering the ability and the reputation of peregrines, the pair nesting here have what appears to be very, very brave and cocky, or monumentally stupid neighbours. Nesting within a metre of the peregrines are jackdaws. There's a jackdaw family and another and another. In fact, there are jackdaws nesting in virtually every single nook and cranny of the cliff wall, yet for some reason the peregrines seem to leave them alone. Indeed, it is the jackdaws that seem to give our peregrines a very hard time on a daily basis. They don't even try to avoid trouble. The nearest jackdaws seem to make it a bit of a sport, actually, to try really annoying the peregrines. It's crazy. It's like goading a Rottweiler. Now, peregrines have the speed and the killing tools to make very short work of a jackdaw, and yet they've been incredibly long-suffering and tolerant of what, in effect, is really cheeky neighbours. But I know something that these jackdaws may not. Now, I've often watched peregrines and jackdaws nesting close to each other, and always the peregrines seem to ignore what looks like an easy meal. But if the jackdaw chicks start to emerge, then we may see a very different story indeed, because suddenly there's an irresistible easy meal, a clumsy jackdaw chick clattering around inside the quarry, and that's usually enough of a stimulus to encourage the male or the female bird to come and get jackdaw to the table. So. You never know. If I was a jackdaw, the last thing I'd be doing is annoying my neighbour, who in all likelihood is going to get its revenge on my kids. So why then do the jackdaws decide to nest so close to trouble? Well, they could be enjoying a degree of protection of their own nest from the peregrines. This is indirect, of course, but the peregrines have magnificent eyesight. They can spot trouble coming from a heck of a long way off. They also tend to dive bomb and hassle any other predator, any bird of prey that comes into the quarry. Peregrine's going to be on its back. So it could well be that these jackdaws are living by the ethos. It's much better to stay with the devil you know rather than the devil you don't. 
It looks like they're having a bit of trouble this evening getting back into their nest. There is a nest, in fact, very close to the chick, just to the left. One of those cavities is a jackdaw nest, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if when those chicks emerge, there's going to be a bit of a problem. Now, I do know that the jackdaws down in Devon are very close to fledging, so if they are anything to go by, then we should be seeing quite a bit of activity over the next few days. I have to begin by saying a huge thank you because so many of you have contacted us to pledge to make space for nature. 30,000 in fact, so keep it up. Now last week I gave you ideas on how you could provide homes or refuges for everything from birds to grass snakes to bees. But wildlife will only stick around if there is plenty of food about. So bird feeders, that's what we're going to look at today. They are probably one of the most popular ways of attracting in birds and the great thing about them is you don't need huge amounts of space. You can put one on a balcony, you can stick one to a window or you can use your windowsill as a bird table. A single bird feeder will make a difference but you could go to town and put up a whole variety of feeders as we've done here and in turn these will bring in a wider variety of birds. And if you're worried about grey squirrels go for squirrel proof feeders. Now winter is obviously the most important time to feed birds but even now when they're raising young birds will be grateful for an easy and reliable source of food. Many more of us are feeding birds than we were 10 years ago and it has made an incredible difference. We've gone from just 20 species to over 80 coming to our gardens for a regular supply of food and some species actually depend on bird feeders to survive the winter. Many farmland birds like reed buntings and black caps can't find enough food on farmland that has been intensively farmed. What to feed them? Well, Something like sunflower seeds are very good. They're a good high energy source of food for things like tits and finches and sparrows. Peanuts are also a good staple, although don't put them on a bird table in spring because they do choke baby birds. Kitchen scraps, bits of old fruit, bread, rice, all entirely acceptable, but the most important thing that you can give birds, extraordinarily, is fat, particularly in the winter. So rather than chucking the fat from your Sunday roast down the sink and blocking your drains, save it, mix it like it is here with bits of fruit and nuts. Or you can simply just put it on slices of bread and put those out and that will really help the birds. And because birds don't spend very much time in front of computers or watching telly, you don't have to worry that you'll be causing a rise in avian heart disease. So, if you really want to attract more birds to your outside space, it's incredibly simple. Just feed them and then let us know. Call us on 08 700 100 160 or go to our website bbc.co.uk forward slash nature and join us in making space for nature. Bill. I mean, I'm all for it, I'm all for it, but I do think they're a bit spoiled these days. I mean, bread and dripping were a treat for me. Weekends, my granny used to make bread and dripping and a couple of peanuts, and I was, I was happy. Nowadays, blue tits are complain. what's this rubbish? We want better. But fortunately, many people provide it for them. And one last word on bird feeding, uh, do feed at this time of the year. I know Kate mentioned that, but do feed at this time of the year, because there's more birds in the garden now than at any other time, if you think about it, because you've got the exhausted parents been bringing up the families, and you've got their offspring. So do continue to feed in the summer. No problem at all. OK, folks, tis badger time. Da -da 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 -da. Over to the badgers, and, well, it's... Quiet down there. I think that's one word for it, or totally empty is another one. But that's a little bit disappointing. Oh, mm, yes, they're four minutes late because over the weekend, over the weekend, now you didn't know this, mm. over the weekend, <gasps> these chaps have been coming out at 8 30. 8 30, and it's 8 34. But this is what happened over the weekend. So we've got lots of pictures, an awful lot of grooming it's going on. It's got a stick stuck up his nose. It has got a stick stuck up his nose. I think that's. <laughs> <laughs> not sure who that was. I think that's, that's mother and dad. <clears throat> well, I'm Sadly glad we, dad, cut, that glad we cut off that as quickly. That was, father is a bit of a flasher by the look of it, and a very big boy with it. If you've got it, flaunt it. That's what they say. During this, by the way, you can hear a lot of alarm calls from blackbirds and robins. That's that chink, chink, chink noise, right? So I think there's danger around, and the badgers react to this eventually. But for the moment, for the moment. Guess what? It's playtime. And that means 
beaten the living daylights out of your brothers and sisters. Dennis is in there somewhere. We, we have to be honest, we can't always tell which one he is, actually. I wouldn't deal with it's a he. It might be Denise's wife. It might. It might well be. But they were so rough, aren't they? They are so aggressive with each other, and it's amazing they come out with sort of everything intact. Uh, I, I'm not sure they do. He's losing a bit of fur on the back there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the back here. He's getting, I think he that's is, Dennis. Yeah. He's getting a bit bald at the wrong end, basically. But, um, as I say, non-stop fighting. Um, and he does seem to be giving as good as he gets. You know, he's not, he's not just sort of sitting back and saying, I might be the smallest, but I'm no. not going to take it. But, uh, you see, this, now go back to this alarm thing. This is Mum. And as Simon King explained to us last week, if Mum actually takes the baby away, it's because she senses danger. The baby attacks Mum, mind you, so reason enough to be dragged off to bed, I'd say. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is precisely what happens to me. But one of them's gone back. And now the cubs are still there. I think that was her. No, there we are. She is dragging off one of the babies. I think it's Dennis who's left out. And I said, no, don't take my brother away. He's always escaped. Yeah. <laughs> and it's wonderful noise they make. Isn't it? yeah. It's like a dolphin or something, isn't it? It's or a bird. And I said, those alarm noises still in the background. The robin ticking as well. I think she knows this, she senses there might be a dog or a person or a walk or something like that, and she's not going to let Look at that, she's just no. absolutely ah. unceremoniously yeah. dragging Get down there. back into the hole. And he thinks, all right, I'll play on my own. I'll play on my own. I don't think he does, actually. <laughs> I think he well, she comes back and drags him down, doesn't That's she? Right. There yeah. we go. Yeah. So, um, come on, lads. It's, what is it? Yeah. Eight. 35, roughly yeah. speaking, and I say they have been out earlier, so... Um... So we'll keep our fingers crossed, but we've got Simon here because um, some of that behaviour we saw, the, yeah. um, the grooming, Simon, we saw both parents grooming one of the cubs. We think it was Dennis. Now, um, grooming, you know, is often seen as a sort of social activity, isn't it? A rather yeah, dirty sure. animal. It, it is very social. <laughs> well, they're... they're, they're, they're certainly quite lousy they've got a lot of fleas badgers which is why they're scratching the whole time but to be honest with you the the grooming has a dual function it is definitely to get rid of some of the bugs that are all over the badgers also to get rid of the soil that they um, inevitably get covered with when they're going down into the earth and to the into the set but it's also very much about reinforcing a social bond a, a badger clan is a really really tight-knit unit a lot of people, you know, you, you think about this animal, it spends most of its time nosing around picking up earthworms. Why has it got such powerful jaws? Well, when they get into a fight, they're just phenomenally aggressive, and I have seen some very, very dramatic scraps between badgers. And when they get into a fight, it's almost invariably with a stranger in the midst. The way they know that they haven't got a stranger is a, a sort of communal smell. Now, when they're grooming, very often you'll see that they sit on each other, and they've got very pungent scent glands at the base of their tail, so that that sitting is not, you know, they're not just doing pile on, they're in fact making a nice communal smelly um, identification, if you like, for the whole group. Um, and that goes on the whole time during those, during those uh, grooming sessions. Oh, thank you. You ought to be down here, really. <laughs> you? Yeah, you probably prefer it up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than the bass rock, though, isn't it? Be honest, be honest. Not quite as smelly, yeah? All right, a lot safer. <laughs> Uh, I, I, we must go down there and have a sniff around the badgers sometime. Because <laughs> if they're leaving that mosque, I'd love to know whether we can actually tell that it's there. Um, think about peregrines, actually. Um, just going back to them. They're one of the big success stories in Britain. Mm. I mean, they used to be persecuted, something shocking, and so did all birds of prey. But peregrines have not only come back strongly, like many birds of prey, they've actually moved into the cities. And this has been the case in America, for example, of peregrines nesting on, on high-rise buildings and skyscrapers. And it's happening now, where I live in London, there's at least two, possibly three pairs of peregrines nesting bang slap wow. in the middle of London on quite famous buildings. I'm not going to say what they are, but you can watch the changing of the guards at the same time. There's a clue. Um, I don't live in the country, which sometimes surprises people. I think I ought to. Perhaps I think I should do. I mean, they prefer <laughs> yes, me to. But I, I've read country. that I live in Norfolk, but I don't. I live in the city, and um, I, nevertheless, I have what they call a local patch there. And I thought, um, I'd like to indulge myself, because I'm getting a bit homesick now. So can we have a look at my local patch, please? Go on. This is last April. Every city has its green oases and um, 
I'm lucky. This is mine. I live in London. There it is. I'm on top of Parliament Hill on Hampstead Heath. And I come here um, most mornings. One of the things I really love about this time of the year is that the trees are all at different stages. You've got some of them where the leaves are completely out, others that have barely got any leaves at all. And you can see up through the trees, there are masses of squirrels on Hampstead Heath, all grey squirrels, of course, nibbling on buds and fresh spring leaves up there. You see, that's nice. You wouldn't get those shapes up on the branches in a few weeks' time because you wouldn't see the squirrels for the leaves. Oh, blimey. Well, I was just about to say that you very rarely actually see squirrel and dre together, but this one is obviously building its dre right now. Stripping bark off the trees, which I know, I know, I know, that's one of the things that gets them into trouble. But not here. Strip all the bark they like. Shredded bark. <laughs> Go on, get hold of it properly. That's better. There you see, I've been coming to Hampstead Heath 15 flipping years at least, and I have never before seen a squirrel actually working on its dray. So that's the thing about a local patch. You can always see something new, and I think it's more exciting when it's on your local patch too. Very nice. People are always surprised that I actually live in the city. Well, I like living in the city, but I think if I didn't have a place like the Heath to escape to, I'll probably go totally nuts. It's not exactly what I'd call peaceful here at the moment. And yet, I can shut all that out and watch the great crested grebes. That's lovely. Oh, they haven't lost their libido. You can hear them calling even over the noise of that 707 or whatever it is coming in. And this is amazing. One of them handing over a large piece of plastic as a love gift. Grebes are in the habit of giving presents to one another as part of the mating ritual, and it's usually a piece of nesting material. But this one has found what appears to be a plastic bag. Well, no, the other one's got the right idea. They're, look, 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 look. It's a twig, and they've swapped them over. That's fantastic. Wow, 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 wow. Ah. It's always exciting to see a rarity on your local patch. Um, and that's what we've got. This is a male ruddy duck. And yes, it's not a very rare bird in England, but this is only the second one I've ever seen on the heath. And this is a lovely male and it's displaying but the chance of a female ruddy duck turning up here as well very small isn't that delightful though so 
Hadei or my local patch. Great value, I reckon. You know, I would have seen something like 40 different species of birds today. More to the point, I've seen some of them incredibly well and all sorts of interesting little stories going on. But uh, there's still time for one more little treat. What about the animals of Heathland? Right, there's just a few left, and I think it would be a lovely end to the day if I would sit down quietly and they were to come out. We'll see. We've been rabbits here for centuries. I like to think that anyway. Call me sentimental if you like, but I think that's an exquisite scene. A family of bunnies nibbling away on a nice gentle evening. I know I said it at the beginning, but um, this is an oasis in the city and every city has one. Ah, oh, quite homesick for a moment there, but be on, honest, it's better here, really. It isn't is it? really it's absolutely lovely fantastic. Here, yes. um, local patches, I, I'm, I'm very, very fond of them, and not just as a hobby, though, because I think they actually contribute an awful lot to, as it were, the bigger picture, you know? Because if you think about it, you've got naturalists looking at local patches all over the country. Put those details together and you get a fantastic idea of what's actually going on in the country in general. And just to give you a very quick example, on, on Hampstead Heath we've got parakeets, we've got kingfishers recently, we've got hobbies nesting, all birds that are successful. We haven't actually got the otters yet, but they could be there any moment. <laughs> Roe deer, Ro deer I think we might have, but the other side of the coin is that I haven't seen a house sparrow there now for three years. I haven't seen a house martin there for three or four years. Those birds are in trouble. And you find out that sort of thing from people who have local patches. So, you know, that bigger picture is only put together as a jigsaw of little pictures. Very, um, there you are, you see, I'm not just ligging about wasting my time, I'm contributing to science. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> and you, wait a minute, yes, go on, confess. Well, yes, I, all right. You I did my little bit this morning bit. while Bill was loitering. I was on the train. Well, all right. <laughs> he was having a line. So I went to check up on one of our newest stars. Have a look at this. Now, you may remember meeting Mrs Wagtail. Our Wagtail, who has nested in a bank right beside an incredibly busy road and right beside our production village. Well, researcher Mike Dilger has been keeping an eye on her. You've been on Wagtail duty. I am the guardian oh. of the bird <laughs> Wagtail. Case. How is she? Well, she has survived the weekend and she's become a bit of a celebrity, actually. Really? People picked up on the programme and yeah. all weekend we've had to marshal people and I've been given the title Pied Wagtail Warden. <laughs> but is she all right? She's doing fine. She is such a resilient bird. You would not believe it. She's what, as we say, three or four metres from the road. Yeah, I mean, she's just in a bank across there, isn't yeah. she? And, and at the moment, she's sitting on and occasionally every ten minutes or so, she's turning her eggs. And when she gets hungry, about every half an hour, she hops off and flies into the middle of the road and plays chicken with all the lorries and the tractors. It does seem staggering. She has got this whole farm to nest on. Why is she here? Well, they normally nest on ditches and banks anyway. It's a nice area. I don't know, she's chosen a slightly crazy place. She's got her head down and she's absolutely totally unfazed. oblivious. Totally unfazed. Astonishing. So she's got five eggs in there. She has. What do you reckon? When, when might we start seeing chicks? It's tough to say because we only just found the nest um, at the end of the month, actually, at the end of May. I think she's going to hatch this week, which would be fantastic for oh, the That series. would be amazing. But that the best thing of all amazing. is, when she's sitting there, she hops off every half an hour and she flies to the road. And I've worked out why she plays chicken. 
The crash is feeding on flies that are hit by the cars and the tractors. So the cars and the tractors are doing the hunting for her and she's just going in and gathering the spoils? I'm squashing the bugs and she's kind of reaping the dividends. Well, keep an eye on her, Mike, because obviously we're very fond of her. We and, are. Um, we all are. She's a all... bit of a cult celebrity. She is. She is. And uh, keep us posted because we want to hear about those chicks. Right you are. Have fun in the sun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't burn your nose. I'll try not to. So obviously Mike is not going to be able to move from that spot now at all, because not only are we going to be making sure he doesn't, but the whole local community are as well. So bad luck, Mike, but thank you very much. Now it is 10 to 9. Will the badgers come out? Keep our fingers crossed, but let's go back for the final time tonight. Sorry, girls, because I know you want to see him more. Simon King. Hi again from the quarry where the peregrine pair are nesting. Lovely atmosphere here at the moment. That's the male bird, the teasel, just settling down for the night. He's got a long day ahead of him tomorrow. Got to get all the food for the family. That's the female, the falcon, she too, just getting ready to roost. And down on the nest, let's have a look at the chick, see how, oh, very happy, very full, very asleep. But there is no doubt about it, a peregrine's true colors are revealed when it takes to the air. Now I've had the good fortune to film peregrines many times. I filmed one pair that nested in a quarry not unlike this and they had the habit of chasing their prey into the quarry, using the quarry as a sort of trap and that gave me the chance to witness and to film several hunts and the opportunity to analyze their hunting techniques. initial approach, blistering speed. This is all in slow motion. I need to emphasize that this is six times slower than normal speed. In reality, this hunt took about 20 seconds. Looks like it's all over. It's not. Pigeons have a very thick covering of feathers and quite often peregrines on their first strike will mess it up and a lot of pigeons get away from this sort of initial hit. Now the chase is really on. Look at the difference in size. That is the female of the peregrines. It's a big bird and a heavy bird, well over a kilo. And when the pigeon decides to turn, you can see that the inertia of the peregrine throws it way off. Suddenly, suddenly the pigeon has an advantage. And the gap widens, you think that's it, it's all over. But in level pursuit, the peregrine falcon has the most phenomenal powered flight. A pigeon in level flight can do about 50 miles an hour. Peregrine closes the gap in no time and it looks once again as though it's all going to be over. But no. Pigeon makes a good move. Peregrine, again, thrown off course. But you can see now the falcon is starting to second guess its prey. Now this, as I mentioned, is a quarry. It's a big quarry. The pigeon might have a chance to escape if it were not for the high walls. And it's not by accident the peregrine has chased it into here. Once again, makes an attempt, but misses. The pigeon, again, power flying, but at the far end is a trap. Now, it's all very well in level flight, but in order to escape, that pigeon is going to have to fly vertically. And that's where the peregrine really excels. Once again, looks like a sure thing, but no. Pigeon makes a valiant attempt, turns on a sixpence, and to be absolutely honest with you, I thought that was the end of the hunt. Just followed the pigeon, expecting it to escape. What in fact was going on is the peregrine gained a bit of height, picked up momentum, a phenomenal speed, and on the final attempt that the pigeon made to escape the quarry, well, the inevitable. Peregrines at their dramatic best. They are the top gun of the bird world and they push the limits of flying ability every single day of their lives. Now, let's just see what's going on over on the cliff at the moment. That's the falcon resting. Beautiful bird. Absolutely lovely day here. Looking forward to lots more of it throughout the course of the week. Back now to you in Devon. Ha, ha, ha.
That was your <laughs> amazing yeah. footage, wasn't it? It was incredible. It should have been. It, uh, it sounded rather like Euro 2004 had started in here. Cause <laughs> as every time the Peregrine went for it, they, everybody in here, and there's quite a few people in this barn, we are not alone, went, oh, like that. And, oh, no, he's missed it again. <laughs> no, he's got to get it. Oh, come on, you know. It was uh, open goals, they thought, open pigeons. But um, no, that was extraordinary. And we have seen a Peregrine over here. So one circling around here. Because Devon, you're never far from the sea and from various um, rock faces. Now, anyway, 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 no, let no, no, us no, no, go. Look. There we are. This is live. It's here. It's now. It's immobile. You can barely see what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rotten view, <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> I don't think this is its best footage. I think that's probably. I th I'm like going to guess adult, that's. It? Yes, I think that's. It may not, of course, be part of the main family because we keep saying we've got mum and dad and we've got little Dennis oh, and we've got oh, brothers. Oh, we've got one creeping on here. And oh, where did that club. come from? That's, that, now, could that be Dennis? There's a bald patch there. At the back. Oh, yes. Oh, he's not looking so frisky now, isn't he? No, he's not. No, look. Oh, yeah. yeah. A bit of a scratch. Yeah, because I was going to say, you know, this. It, we we keep talking about the cubs and the and the pet. They just seen something there. Yeah, they have. Oh, oh, what, oh no, what's happening? They went oh, for it. That's interesting. They've gone no, for they've gone something. Back down, oh no, they've gone to another back hole. Down to a hole. Ah, that wasn't the main hole then. I'll get it. I'll get to this if it kills me. I keep saying. <laughs> I keep saying, uh, go on, babe, go on, interrupt me. I know you're going to. Uh, you're being upstaged. I know. Well, it's not doing boys. anything. I'm, sorry, I'm just trying to say that there are more than just the family. You know, mum, dad, three cubs, but we've seen six or seven once to us, and there could be 15 down there. You know, we just don't know. Because, oh, it fell in. <laughs> Why would it do that? That's extraordinary, because, I mean, let's face it, most animals are not clumsy. I hope it hasn't hurt itself or something, because that, that, that wasn't a very well, graceful decision. you know, it is, it? it is, it's just coming up to nine o'clock, it's sort of getting dusky, maybe it just... It's not, well, not really awake yet. Yeah. Because it's all the other way around, It's all the other way it, around. And there are a lot more holes. I mean, you know, we can show you one, two, and if we pan around, I dare say, there's a few more visible, but there's a lot more around the back. There's, I don't know how many holes there are, though. It's something like 20 it's, odd different holes. It's a isn't huge it? set. Absolutely, it's absolutely huge. And this is traditional. I mean, badgers come back to the same set, you know, that, well, they don't go, they don't ever leave, actually, the family, generation to generation. And we've been talking about luring creatures into your space, like putting out food for the birds. Um, you can't really lure badgers, you know. And I've, I've had people say, you know, how do I get badgers in my garden? They're not lawn lovers, by and large, these people, I have no. to say. But they, you can't. You've just got to hope you inherit them, and you're lucky. Oh, They're there they are. Another, yeah. another site there. I think we're running out of time, Kate. I hate this moment, but I th I think it's we wind are. up time. Well, um, don't... Let, don't forget um, to let us know whether you can make space for nature, even if you can't lure a badger into your garden. There are plenty of things you can do. And call us to let us know. 08700 100 160. All go to the website, bbc.co.uk forward slash nature. The webcam will be going. Oh, and um, if you are particularly interested in the battle between red and grey squirrels, at 9 o'clock, so just after the show, on BBC Radio 4, there's a programme tonight about that very thing, but we'll be doing more later on in the series, won't we? Yes, and you'll be able to see them on television. Oops! Anyway, um, <laughs> tomorrow, 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 um, we've got to check out our wagtails. We have to make sure she's all right. I think we're going to start charging the public. <laughs>